let's give you some stats about divorce because it's real it's real out there so some stats about divorce this is the united states i want to give you this and so the united states 41 percent of first marriages end in divorce and i'm reading these stats from uh us usa.gov this is uh the cdc stats center for disease control hey what's up what's up everybody and so 60% of second marriages end in divorce and 73% of third marriages end in divorce. Check that out. They say the average divorce age is 30. And you'd like to know that the age group that is most popular with being divorced is the age group that is 20 to 24 years of age with uh, over 36% of women and over 38% of men getting divorced in that age group one divorce happens approximately every 36 seconds 2400 divorces per day and 876,000 divorces per year that's 100 divorces per per hour and it won't happen to me you're right because my name is david winston and i am happy to be married to nicole winston and we will be celebrating our eighth year of marriage next month and so i am happily married and uh there is no divorce in sight for us and will never be because uh, i'll tell you why um but i wanted to read some of these stats for you hold on though i got a couple more the average length of a marriage that end, ends in divorce is eight years and the average age for couples i told you was 30 years old it says if your parents are happily married your risk of divorce decreases by 14 percent and thank you i appreciate that i do have a lovely wife i agree living together prior to getting married can increase the chance of getting divorced by as much as 40 percent i'll be trying to tell them stop that shacking it does not help now the Barner Research Group, if you're not familiar with the Barner Research Group, they actually, um, they're a Christian group that does studies, but they give some really raw data. And they talked about religion. So all you, uh, all you believers out there, you Christian, you're like, nah, that ain't us. You know, we believers. So, you know, our divorce rates are much lower. I got you. Hold on. They found that 29% of Baptists are divorced. That's the highest rate for any U.S. religious group, while only 21% of atheists and agnostics were divorced. That's crazy. That is, that's crazy. And so, you know, I'm just here showing some stats, and I don't believe that's going to be you. But I wanted to show some stats about why I'm talking about what I'm talking about and why it's so important. Me and my wife, we really agree and believe on the sanctity of marriage, the covenant of marriage, the importance of marriage, and being able to speak about healthy and whole relationships. I wanted to give you some top reasons why marriages and relationships fail. And the number one reason that I've been able to find why relationships and marriages fail is because of selfishness. Yes, that's it selfishness just tell the person to look in the mirror that's the person to blame uh, selfishness and this is why I say that because you know we all want what we want and when I've been able to see different marriages that have maybe been on the rocks and on the brink of divorce and come back and come to thrive and then marriages that are on the brink of divorce and actually go through divorce I've always been able to name one major part portion that played a major role in it and it's selfishness I want what I want, the way I want, and I want you to give it to me the way I want. Now, I'm not saying that people shouldn't be loved and cared for. I'm not talking about abuse or infidelity. I'm talking about just straight selfishness. And even, you know, even infidelity can be grounded in selfishness because, uh, you know, you made a selfish choice. And so the number one reason why marriage is foul is selfishness. And so marriages grow when you have love there, but not just love. The love of God. What is the love of God? That's selflessness. That's love without conditions. That's love that you don't have to work for. Me and my wife, we call it love for free. That when you put your spouse, your relationship, your mate ahead of yourself, you are sowing the seed for growth in your relationship. I want you to take a moment to share this with somebody else. Invite your Twitter followers, Facebook friends. I want you to invite all your followers on Periscope because I'm going to go for a couple more minutes talking about the top reasons why marriages and relationships fail. So, Make sure you tap that screen if you're feeling this, if you believe that, yeah, this is it, this is right there, this is on. So, 
Let's keep going. Emotionally driven and not purpose driven. That is why relationships and marriages fail. Emotionally driven, not purpose driven. Me and my wife are founded on a basic principle. You know what the basic principle says? It is found in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. What does that mean for us? That means that we have come together for exactly, Jocelyn, uh, uh, we have come together for a common goal, and that's a kingdom of God goal, and God has called us together to be able to increase people, help people, and help marriages. And so we know that the goal for us being together is God's purpose first and foremost. And when we have God's purpose first and foremost, that is one of the strongest bonds that keeps us. And because our marriage isn't founded on an emotion of love, but it's founded on a uh, on the principle and person of love, that is God and Jesus Christ, then we've already sown the seed for our marriage to grow because it's not founded on something that's going to waver. Hey, your emotions change right one day you're up one day you're down one day you're happy next day you know sad emoticon but let me tell you when you have your emotions uh, laid to the side and you put your relationship on something that is solid that means that when things are bad you don't look um, to that relationship to tell you what to do with it you look to God you look to that thing that's foundational that thing that's solid and so you got to get that foundation right different value systems that's another thing that really affects people and separates people they have different value systems when me and my wife do premarital counseling we say we you must make sure that your value systems are in line if one person believes in spanking kids and another person doesn't that's a value system issue if one person says yeah lying and cheating is cool and another person says absolutely not you crazy you tripping well let me tell you you got a value system issue red alert ring the alarm you are about to have some issues in life hold up stop the tape rewind let's go and get some things straight and so you got to make sure that your value systems are in line me and my wife our value systems were in line and they really do line up with each other now it doesn't mean that we're robots and we don't have our own opinions but when it comes down to the very important stuff our value systems are right in line with each other which means that we don't have a lot of potential for conflict in those things that really matter to us because what you have in that core belief system that's stuff that really matters to you and when it really matters to you it's really going to disappoint you when another person that you love and hold so dearly doesn't have that same value system. Let's keep going. Different love languages or different communication styles. I don't know if you've ever studied the book Five Love Languages, but it's really, really key. And when you're not willing to communicate love in the way that they want to receive it, then sometimes it feels like it's not love at all. You might be, and if you're familiar with this, this will mean something to you, you might be an acts of service person, meaning that the way people show love for you and to you is when they do things for you. Hey, let me go take your car to get washed. Let me go vacuum out your car. You know what? Let me go do something for you. I'll go clean your house. I'll go take care of something for you. You really feel loved by that. Well, let me tell you, if your spouse is a person who really feels loved by by, um, by let's say uh, um, let's say words of affirmation. That means that me telling you that you're awesome, you're great, you can do it. I'm so proud of you, and all the great qualities that words can express to somebody that you value them, you love them. If your spouse is a words of affirmation person, but you're already giving them acts of service because that's how you like to be loved. Let me tell you, we have had people uh, counsel with us, and they say, "Well, my husband doesn't love me," and the husband says, "What are you talking about? I, I don't love you." Uh, I do this for you, I do this for you, I do this for you. Well, that might be the wrong love language. They might be ready to just hear you say how much you think they're awesome, how much you appreciate them, how pretty and beautiful they are. They're just waiting to hear that. They just want to hear some words. But, you know, you're doing all these deeds, but that's not really how they interpret love. And that's how all of us are designed. We interpret love through different things, through different avenues, through different mechanisms. So check out that Five Love Languages books, and it's really going to help you. But I I'm here to say that I've seen many different couples who just speak different languages of love, and what happens is one feels like they're loving the other and the other feels like they're loving the other but they're missing each other's languages like if i speak to you in spanish but you only speak english and i'm saying well i'm communicating with you and you're saying i don't understand a word you're saying i, I hear you saying something but i can't understand it therefore i can't receive the importance of the message that's important check it out so let's keep going difficulty adapting to change Man, let me tell you, especially for y'all young couples out there, if you are uh, below the age of 25, 
I consider you a younger couple. Doesn't mean that you're immature. It has nothing to do with your maturity. But what it does have to do is how you're going to develop in life. I am a different person now than I was at 19. I'm a different person now than I was at 24. It is just natural how development happens. And so some people, you know, they get mad, they get in a relationship, they've been together for three, four, or five years, and they say, oh, you've changed. You've changed. What's wrong with you? You've changed. You didn't used to be like that. Well, you know what? Newsflash. The only thing that is constant in life is change. Everybody's going to change. I should change. I should not be the same at 25 and 40. I should be a different person at 40, hopefully for the better, but I should be a different person. I shouldn't be a 40 year old acting like I'm 25. And so change is inevitable. So you got to be able to be willing to know that you are in for the ride, in for the change. And hopefully if you have a good mate, you have a good spouse, then they're going to continue to want to change for the better, to get better for their family, get better, of course, first and foremost, uh, to serve God, and then get better to serve you as a spouse. And so I'm here to tell you, if you're a young couple, if you're, you know, 19, let me tell you, there's going to be a lot of change that's going to happen in you in the next several years. And you got to know that that person that's with you is going to be there and, and be willing to go through the changes with you and know that they can adapt to the person that you're becoming. You're not going to be the same person all your life. You're going to change year after year, uh, decade after decade. You're going to become different. And so they got to be willing to adapt with the changes with you. Uh, also, love is always Always sought out but only giving sparingly you know this is one of the real issues um, with relationships and marriages when love is always sought out but given sparingly with strings attached and let me tell you what I mean women need love and men need respect so you got women need love men need respect and so, you know, and, and I believe that we could see this even in the Bible because it says, husbands love your wife as Christ loves the church. And then it says uh, to wives to submit themselves um, to their husbands as unto the Lord. And so we see that that submission could really in turn be communicated as respect. And a lot of times when uh, a man uh, is not feeling the relationship or is just really having some issues with the wife, you can almost always track it back to feeling disrespected at some level. When a woman is having issues with their man, you can almost always track it back to them feeling not loved in some level, some respect. And so when you have love and respect and everybody understands and respects the process and knows the thing that the other needs to be fulfilled in, it really makes it helpful. So I really believe that when, you know, as a man, when, um, when I don't respect my wife, or excuse me, when I don't love my wife and show her love, show her compassion, show her love in the way that she communicates love, Love, then she doesn't feel loved and she doesn't understand um, the positive aspects of the relationship, you know, because I'm not showing her that love. She doesn't feel intimate and close to me. And then same thing with men. You know, if you're feeling disrespected, if you're always getting disrespected, always getting put down by a woman, you're always getting treated by a woman, then, you, you know, you might feel disrespected, especially if it's public, especially if it's public uh, in front of friends or in front of family. Uh, family or people that you're close to, uh, that can really affect you as a man and can really make you feel like uh, your, your woman really just doesn't care as much about you uh, through that disrespect. And so I'm here to tell you, you know, as a man, love your woman. As a woman, respect your man. And as you respect your man, they'll feel loved. Uh, also, you know, um, I believe this, and you know, I saw this um, uh, posted somewhere and I thought this was really good, that if salvation is the wedding, discipleship is the marriage. And, you know, when you have, um, you know, you have the wedding, uh, it's a great time of joy and celebration. But let me tell you, the marriage is the thing that you're really going to have to work on. The marriage is the transformation part. The marriage is the hard part. The wedding, you know, folks spend all this time on the wedding. I said, the wedding is easy, y'all. This, this is your day. Let's just get through it. The hard part is going to be the marriage. <laughs> and so, you know, call me after the first two, three months and uh, endless talk. And, you know, some, sometimes I have some couples who kind of want to give up. They got into it for the first year and they're like, what have I done? This is crazy. This man is crazy. This chick is crazy. I don't know what to do. Well, let me tell you the reason why you think that and the reason why you kind of go in haywire is now you're getting to know them on a more deeper, intimate level. And as you get into a deeper, intimate knowledge of them, it starts to expose the things that you didn't see before. Marriage is just an amplifier. It just amplifies the qualities and the things in a person's heart that you didn't see before. And so especially when, when you're in the first couple years of, of relationship and even marriage, 
you know, they call it the honeymoon phase, you can be in what's called uh, still infatuation love. Doesn't mean it's not tr real love, but it's infatuation love, meaning that um, the great qualities of that person, the beauty of that person, the awesome things that you love about that person, the thing that brought you close to them, that's still so amplified to you that it starts to mask all of the, um, all of maybe some of the issues or the things that you don't like, the little annoyances, but after those two years, you know, you start starting to see some of those things that maybe you didn't see before. So marriage is just an amplifier. It just gives you a greater uh, scope. Like, have you ever looked at something under a microscope? So you look at it, you know, with your natural eye, you're like, oh, okay, you know, it's a little speck, but you look at it under a microscope and you can see all the intimate details of that thing. Well, that's kind of how marriage is. And so when you get together, you have all your time together. You're always in the same house, in the same space. You occupy the same bed, maybe sharing the same sink. And so now you're always together and it's an amplifier. And so what you have to do is you have to choose to love your spouse. I heard Love McPherson say this, a good friend of ours. She said this, she said, in a marriage seminar that you have to wake up every day and choose to love your spouse especially after you after you've been married several years you have to now make a choice it's not just about um, you know just loving them like oh I love you Ooh, you're so good to me but it's now about making a choice and every day you make that choice and if you're with the right one you're with somebody who, who loves you who values you you're in the relationship that God has really planned for you um, and, and you're you're ready to serve them then you're gonna make the right decision you're gonna wake up as going to be an easy decision. It's a no-brainer, as they say. Yeah, I'm going to love my spouse. And, you know, even if she wake up, she looking all crusty, you know, hair all to the side, morning breath like fire, you know, you still say, hey, I'm going to love you and I'm, I'm enjoying this ride. And so I want to encourage you guys, it's not about becoming perfect before you get married. You know, if you're not married, if you're in a relationship right now, it's not about becoming perfect. It's about the journey. It's about who you become, you know, in the midst of the journey. Uh, it, it's never about becoming perfect before you get married because uh, <laughs> there's no such thing. It, it's kind of like, because um, we're not perfect people, it's kind of like uh, if you've ever learned to ride a bike. And as you learn to ride a bike, um, nobody starts off riding a bike awesome. Now you might have some skills, you might have balance, you know, maybe because of some things that you've done before, you go into starting to try to ride a bike with some great skills, but yet everybody looks awkward. Everybody looks uncomfortable. Everybody feels maybe a little bit unsafe and a little unsettling. That's everybody. Why? Because you're learning to do something new. You can't get on the bike and learn how to ride a bike and say, I want to be perfect before I learn how to ride the bike. It's just not what happens. You can prepare yourself with skills and learning and understanding in theory what's happening, but nobody can tell you how to be married in theory. They can get you prepared and you can be armed for battle. You can, you can go to seminars, premarital classes. You can read the Bible and good books and you know you can prepare yourself but there's nothing like being in the journey of marriage and if you prepare yourself well then you won't have a lot of surprises but uh, what happens is as marriage is an amplifier it's going to reveal to you things that are in your heart and it's going to reveal to you who you are and maybe some of that stuff might be kind of yucky you might not like some of that stuff but when you deal with it and you continue to get better um, you'll be able to see that God is working on your heart this marriage is helping you work on your heart and you'll be able to see some really good fruit and your spouse will really appreciate the fact that you love them enough that you want to get better each and every day and so it's not about um, becoming perfect before you get married. It's about continuing to be perfected through the process of marriage. And, uh, and so I just want to encourage you guys, um, don't abandon the process and stick with it. You know, if you're in a relationship, you're in a marriage, continue to stick with it. Get better each and every day. Make sure that you have good people around you that are encouraging you. You know, you can read some good resources. At the top of my scope, I showed a book uh, by Miles Monroe, Single Married, Separated in Life After Divorce by the late married, uh, by the late Miles Monroe. It's a really, really good book. There's also a lot of other good books. Also, I have on my link on my bio, I have a marriage prayer that me and my wife say each and every day for our marriage. We believe in praying over our marriage and keeping our marriage protected and covered, and we believe that prayer is powerful. So make sure to go to my link in my bio, and you'll be able to uh, download that same prayer that we say, and I want you to say it over your relationship, say it over your marriage each and every day to be able to, what we call Satan-proof your marriage, be able to protect your marriage against all those negative influences and all those things that'll try to creep in 
and take over because you got to you got to be proactive in protecting your marriage uh, and the link is in my bio so if you go in my bio you can uh, you can tap on it it'll take you right to it but you got to Satan proof your marriage and uh, and I really believe it's really important that you be on the offensive let me tell you you can't just be out here on social media all willy-nilly nowadays with no plan you know sometimes you got to know who to follow who not to follow and if folks that you're following uh, you know they got all kind of skin showing all kind of stuff hanging out all kind of junk you know hanging to the side you you got to push yourself away from that you got to divorce yourself from that because uh you know social media i mean it's listed i think the last that i said was social media was listed in one third of divorces in this country and so it's a real thing it's a real epidemic and and even i don't like when there's stuff on my social media that i didn't ask for that is trying to appeal to my flesh and you got women all half naked and stuff i say uh uh i don't, don't want to see that i don't want to be in that realm because i need to make sure that my marriage is safe protected and and I keep these eye gates and these ear gates safe from all that other garbage. I don't need to be be seeing no other woman's goodies. All I care about is my wife's goodies. That's all I need, and uh, and that's all I want. And so. I make sure to shut that stuff down and so sometimes you got to close social media accounts me and my wife we have counsel with couples who have had to make the decision to shut down social media accounts because it was infringing on their marriage it was trying to creep in and create discord and I'm here to tell you if you got to do it make the investment in your relationship in your marriage ain't no social media account out there worth your marriage or worth your relationship so make sure that you take the initiative to shut that stuff down and you know sometimes you say well you know I want to stay connected with people well do you want to stay connected with people or you don't do you want to stay connected with your relationship and your marriage I choose my relationship and marriage and so you know I'm, I'm on different social media networks I'm on Twitter and Instagram and, and here on Periscope uh, I don't do Facebook um, but I, I never I actually I never felt comfortable doing Facebook um, you know I helped to manage the go hard for Christ fan page but I never felt comfortable doing Facebook for that reason you know I just I, I just don't like so much action access to so many people and 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 I don't you know just 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 how I am and so you know I like to uh, I like to keep it that way you know play it safe and so I saw a couple questions I'm gonna try to hit them before I get off the scope so I can go home to my own wife it's probably like where's my husband no nah, she knows I'm on the scope so if you had a couple questions I'll take a couple questions for the last few minutes I know I said a lot it's trying to go fast um, but I appreciate all the love all the hearts thank you for sharing thank you for um, inviting other people to the scope. My name is David Winston and I like to encourage people. Success school, that's what we're in. We're in success school and so I like to encourage people and, uh, and I encourage them in many different ways. But God has a plan for us all and that's one of the primary ways I like to encourage. So what about trust issues? How do you deal with it? Um, okay, you know, well, without asking a whole laundry list of questions, because, you know, it could be very specific questions. Uh, trust issues, you know, th those can stem from many different things. You know, sometimes some people have experienced infidelity. Some people might experience um, behavior that is, uh, you know, that is scandalous behavior, I'll call it. Uh, and, and so sometimes trust issues can be tricky. But I say, you know, trust, building back trust isn't like, um, it's not like building a skyscraper in a day. A skyscraper is built, you know, brick by brick, uh, beam by beam, wall by wall, and so it's a process. And whenever you have trust issues, um, first of all, I, I say uh, you have to forgive the person who was responsible for those trust issues. And I see that question, let me get to it in just a second. Um, you have to make sure that you forgive the person that's responsible for even um, hurting you to make you have any kind of trust issues because usually that's where it stems from some sort of unmet expectation or some behavior that was not appropriate that hurt you and made you put a wall up and put a guard up so i believe that forgiveness is always the first portion of being able to not be guarded unnecessarily against everyone i believe you also have to use wisdom because you don't want to be run over you don't want to be taken advantage of over and over again and so the best thing that i can say is um make sure that you forgive first and foremost to make sure that your perception goes back to something that's a positive perception and then i believe that you know i believe you all should always should incorporate god into your relationship because he's the bond he'll help you make it strong and so i suggest that you pray and get somebody close to you that you trust not somebody that's going to gossip not somebody who has some jaded opinion jaded view not somebody who's been married four times and divorced 
four more. I, I'm not talking about that person, but I'm talking about somebody that you trust. And not only do you trust, but has a proven track record of success in marriages and in relationships. Find somebody that, that can be close to you, that can be a partner to you and help you walk through that process of restoration. And I believe that you will get there. Um, I saw another question. Um, somebody asked another question. I said, hold on, I'll get to it. Um, if you're still around, can you just please repost that question? Thank you for your patience. If men don't initiate prayer in your relationship, does that mean he's not marriage material? No, uh, not necessarily. Um, just because a man doesn't initiate uh, a prayer doesn't necessarily mean he's not marriage material. Um, you know, there could be different factors. Some men are... Um, are just more reserved they might not be as forward or forthright in doing it sometimes it might not be in their nature especially if um, if they're more low-key more laid back you know certain personality types are definitely um, more laid back and so uh, it may not be that they're um, you know marriage not marriage material but uh, I do agree yes I was told that men should take the lead I do agree um, and sometimes it helps when you have a talk of expectations for them not like you're giving them an ultimatum but let them know that there's something that's something that you desire you know for some men sometimes we just don't we just don't know and and to be let out of a relationship because I didn't pray with my woman but I didn't know that maybe that's something she wanted or cared about or maybe I was just being lazy and I knew I should do it but maybe I was hesitant for whatever reason or I just kind of let other things take priority talk to him talk to him and, and be open with him um, you know and if you talk to him be open with him and let him know that hey I would really like to do this this is important to me see how he responds if he really loves you he cares for you and uh, and he's a man of God I believe that he'll respond in a positive way and you all will be able to move forward um, how do you tell your spouse you need alone time with, uh, with I guess, without offending him? Um, easy. Have a conversation with him. Um, you know, guys, sometimes we can be like kind of brain dead. We can be kind of dense. And so uh, you just got to like tell us like straight out like, look, <laughs> um, I feel like I need some alone time. And you know what I found is that the stronger and more secure you are in your marriage, the less... Um, the less the less chance I have at being offended at that statement. It does take a certain level of security within the relationship because, I mean, if it's new, it's fresh, you know how you are, you know, first three months of relationship and your spouse or, or maybe, I guess, girlfriend, boyfriend, whoever says, you know, I need just a little bit of time today and, you know, you might be freaking out like, what, what's wrong? What did I do? Why you need space all of a sudden? But, um, but you know... You just got to make sure to vote, voice your opinion. I know sometimes it can be difficult. You know, it might sound easy, but it's not. Yeah, sometimes it can be difficult um, to have those one-on-ones. But let me tell you, guys always respect uh, the fact that you told them. And even if they don't act like it in the moment, they respect at least the fact that you were direct. Um, and they will understand, you know, and, and if they don't understand, hopefully they will soon because that is a part of life because sometimes we just do need our alone time. But it helps for you to explain, explain why you need alone time. If you say, hey, it's not you. I actually need alone time because of this, 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 this. I'm actually more of an introvert by nature and the way I actually fill back up on energy, the way my energy kind of replenishes is when I actually have some alone time. That actually doesn't mean I need to be alone by myself sometimes you know I can have my wife there and still kind of get that replenishment of energy but what happens with extroverts is they replenish their energy by being around people but an introvert like me I actually my energy kind of gets drained by having to be around people and having a lot of discussions and so I do need that alone time and so you know I've, I've told my, my wife before you know times where I feel like I just kind of need a little bit of alone time but you know I'll explain to her and she'll understand she knows sometimes she's done it to me you know and she'll say just been this and that and I just need a little me time just time for myself and and I believe that if you really explain and express really how you're feeling let them know and reassure them hey there's nothing wrong with you this is what I need for me so I can be better for you and I think that's the key when you let them know that this is helpful for me and if I can help me then I can be better for you and uh, and I think that's good so uh, do I have